through okay? Can everyone hear me? I think yes, I've turned perfect. off. Yeah, that's okay. And I've got the video on at the moment. I'm going to share screen in a minute. Uh, thank you very much for coming. And just a heads up, um, with this presentation, uh, I'm going to be talking for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. I actually thought the session was a little bit shorter than I see that it is uh, on the schedule. So um, anyway, there'll be plenty of time uh, after I talk about the research uh, for us to talk about questions and answers. Uh, so yeah, hello everyone. Thank you very much for coming to the presentation. You'll see me looking backwards and forwards a little bit side to side here because I've got a couple of screens set up that I'm using. Um, anyhow, I hope you're all doing well during these obviously very strange times. Because we're doing the conference remotely, uh, this session is being recorded. So there should be a copy of the recording uh, and the slides available on the AZ TESOL website. I'm also recording and I'm going to post my slides and an audio recording of the presentation on my own website. Um, and I'm going to share the screen now so you can see that address. Let's see here. Okay. Can everyone see that okay? Yes, it's good. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, so there will be a copy of my audio recording and the slides at that uh, address at the bottom of the slide you can see there. I'll put this up this address up again at the end of the presentation uh, in case you want to jot that down and please feel free to visit that anytime. So we'll be looking this morning at the findings and practical implications of some research that I've been doing with teachers of English for academic purposes or EAP. And we'll start with a little background and then I'll describe the research and the main findings and then we'll talk about what this might mean for us in our own classrooms and programs. And like I said, that's going to take about 20 minutes and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. Oops, okay, I'm trying to go to the next slide. There we go. Great. Okay, so here's the problem that was the foundation of this research. EAP courses have a basic purpose of teaching students knowledge and skills that will help them as they work through their academic programs. And that means that whatever knowledge and skills the students learn in the EAP course, they should be able to transfer out of the course to their other courses. Now, research in educational psychology has shown that learning doesn't automatically lead to transfer. So it's possible that students learn and perform well in an EAP course, but when they leave the course, they never make use of what they had learned. In other words, they don't transfer the learning. So to try to avoid this, there are things that teachers can do, but those things aren't always obvious or easy to do. And that's reflected in this quote, which says that EAP teachers can struggle with teaching for transfer. So that's the general problem that I wanted to look at and to see what solutions we might be able to find. Okay, on this slide, here's a little bit more background about this idea of teaching for transfer. First, we can look at learning transfer as happening in two ways called low road transfer and high road transfer. Low road transfer is transfer that happens automatically, like when I get behind the wheel of a car that I've never driven before, but I'm able to drive it without any thought because everything that I've learned from driving other cars before transfers automatically to this new situation because of all the similarities, like a steering wheel and foot pedals that are similar to the steering wheels and foot pedals in all of the other cars that I've driven before. But the other kind of transfer called high road transfer is quite different because instead of being automatic, it's intentional. For example, instead of a new car, maybe I find myself sitting on a motorcycle for the very first time. And the motorcycle doesn't have a steering wheel or pedals, so I don't automatically transfer things that I've learned from driving cars. But when I'm on that motorcycle, maybe I intentionally think about strategies that I've used before when I've driven cars, like not getting too close to other vehicles on the road. And I try to do the same thing 
on the motorcycle. In this case, transfer happens even though the two situations, the, the cars that I've driven in the past and the motorcycle that I'm sitting on now aren't so similar. So with that in mind, there are practical suggestions out there for how to teach in ways that will help to promote low road and high road transfer. A technique for promoting low road transfer is called hugging. And that means designing instruction to be similar to target situations. So for example, if I'm teaching an EAP course and the students are engineering majors, I might try to design the EAP course so that it has similarities with the students engineering courses, maybe similar kinds of activities or similar kinds of content. On the other hand, a technique for promoting high road transfer is called bridging. And that means teaching in a way that gets students to think abstractly about what they're learning and to think about how they might transfer learning. For example, in my EAP course, I might ask students to look at examples of academic writing and figure out what it is that makes those examples effective. This way, the students are coming up with abstract principles, and that kind of learning can be transferred to a wide variety of situations. And one more point on this slide is that these teaching for transfer techniques aren't necessarily unusual. Even without focusing on transfer, EAP teachers may already be using activities that are similar to target situations, and that's hugging or they may already be using activities that are, are already getting uh, students to learn abstractly, and that's bridging. But it may be the case that these kinds of techniques are being used only occasionally and not enough to really maximize the student's learning transfer. Okay, so with this problem and background information in mind, I put together a study based on these research questions on this slide. Do EAP teachers teach for transfer? If so, how? And what struggles, if any, have they had? And to answer those questions, here's what I did. In fall 2019 and spring 2020, I contacted EAP teachers at a university and community colleges in a major metro area here in the US to ask if I might be able to interview them. 26 teachers agreed and I interviewed each of them once and most of those interviews were face to face in person and the final few were remote because of the pandemic. Uh, the interviews were semi-structured, so I used a set of general questions about teaching for transfer, and then we had lots of flexibility to talk about whatever answers they gave. And I recorded all of the interviews so I could transcribe and analyze them later. So we'll take a look now at the main findings, and we'll start with the first research question, which asked, uh, do EAP and uh, teachers teach for transfer? If so, how? And the findings showed that yes, all of these teachers described one or more specific techniques that they used to teach for transfer. And although they didn't use the terms hugging and bridging, based on their descriptions, it was clear that they were using these kinds of techniques. Most of the teachers 92% described techniques that looked like they fit the definition of hugging. For example, one of the teachers explained that instead of teaching the students about MLA formatting for documenting sources, she taught them about APA formatting because they were engineering students and that's the formatting that they would use in their engineering courses. And some of the teachers, 24%, described techniques that looked like they fit the definition of bridging. An example of that was that one of the teachers said she had students give presentations to teach the class about grammar rules. Now rules can be quite abstract, so getting students to teach each other about grammar rules sounds like a way of getting them to think abstractly about whatever it is that they're learning.
And moving on, the second research question asked, what struggles, if any, have these EAP, EAP teachers had when teaching for transfer? And the findings showed that yes, they have had struggles. I grouped the struggles that they talked about into three general categories, which we'll take a look at now. The first general category of struggles was that in some cases, the teachers felt that they were unprepared to teach for transfer. And this happened in a few ways. The first, which you can see here next to the letter A, was that the teachers said they thought they lacked some kind of relevant knowledge. For example, knowledge of students' other courses or knowledge of teaching techniques and tools. In this example from one of the interviews, this teacher said that some of the students took other courses in the area of law enforcement, but she didn't know anything about those courses. I'll leave that up there for just a second so you can read the transcript excerpt. Okay. And on this slide, next to the letter B, here's another way that teachers felt that they were unprepared to teach for transfer. Some said that they felt they lacked necessary resources, more specifically that they lacked time. In this interview, for example, the teacher said that there were all sorts of things that she would like to do to teach for transfer, but just hadn't had the time. And moving on, on this slide next to the letter C, here's one more way that teachers felt that they were unprepared to teach for transfer. Some described an affective issue, in other words, something related to emotion that was getting in the way. For example, low self-confidence or high anxiety. For example, in this interview, the teacher said she wasn't confident in her ability to teach writing, so students might question some of her teaching techniques. So that's it for the first category of struggles, teachers feeling unprepared to teach for transfer. And at the top of this slide, we can see that the second general category of struggles was about the students, that in some cases they were not prepared for the teachers to teach for transfer. And the teachers talked about this in a few ways as well. Uh, first, next to the letter A on this slide, students were unprepared because they, they lacked some kind of ability for example, writing ability or ability to see connections between the EAP course and other courses, or ability to do particular activities in class. In this example, this teacher said that when she taught for transfer, she worried that the students might not be able to handle it because of their level of English proficiency. Okay, and moving on to the next slide. So here we can see next to the letter B that another way the teachers thought that students were unprepared was because of affective issues. In other words, things related to emotion, like a lack of motivation to learn or a lack of motivation to transfer learning. In this example, the teacher said that the students who are engineering majors don't want to take EAP courses, and they think that they're not going to have to use anything that they learn in the EAP course. And one more on this slide next to the letter C, we can see that one more way teachers thought that students were unprepared was because of a lack of resources, specifically a lack of time. In this example, a teacher said that his students are busy because some of them are taking a large number of credits per semester.
So that's it for the second category of struggles, which is students being unprepared for the teacher to teach for transfer. So let's move on to the next one. At the top of this slide, we can see that the third general category of struggles, the third and final general category of struggles is about the curriculum, that in some cases it hinders teaching for transfer. The teachers described a few ways that this can happen. And the first of these, next to the letter A on this slide, is that the curriculum can lack specificity. This means that in some cases, teachers found it difficult to teach for transfer because their students were from too many different majors. In this example, the teacher said it would be impossible to make the EAP course similar to the students' other courses because of the number of different majors that his students were from. And moving on to the next slide, uh, next to the letter B at the top uh, here, this is another way that the curriculum can hinder teaching for transfer by having a lack of flexibility. In some cases, teachers found it difficult to teach for transfer because there were too many things that they were required to cover in the course. In this example, the teacher said that she hadn't been able to do all the teaching for transfer that she wanted to do because teachers were told what they had to teach. And on this slide, next to the letter C, is one more way that the curriculum can hinder teaching for transfer through a lack of support. For example, a lack of support from colleagues or lack of training about teaching for transfer or a lack of practical guidelines about how to teach for transfer. For example, in this interview, the teacher said that in her institution, teachers don't form a supportive community. So that's it for the third general category, the curriculum hindering teaching for transfer. So those were the three general categories. And on this next slide, we get a sense of how common these struggles were. Uh, the most common struggles are at the top of the table. And we can see that that's the curriculum lacks specificity, number one. And number two, that the students have effective issues. Whereas the least common struggles at the bottom of the table were that students lack resources and teachers have effective issues. And I'm gonna move on one slide that shows this table again, but with a little bit of color. So here, the color gives us a little bit more information. The blue rows are for the first general, general category of struggles the, that the teacher feels unprepared to teach for transfer. That was the first general category that we talked about a couple of minutes ago. That's blue. The green rows are for the second general category that we talked about a few minutes ago. Uh, the, the category of students being unprepared for the teacher to teach for transfer. That's green. And the yellow rows are for the third general category of struggles, which is the curriculum hindering teaching for transfer. That's yellow. So we can see that in terms of those three general categories, the most common struggles seem to be related to the curriculum, yellow, and to the students, green rather than to the teacher's own preparation, which is blue. So that's it for the findings. And on this final slide, we'll take a few minutes and look at some um, possible practical implications of the findings. First, the findings showed that these teachers do teach for transfer. And this includes lots of examples of hugging and some examples of bridging. So one implication in the first bullet here 
is that EAP teachers can be encouraged to look at what they're already doing in class because they might already be using techniques that can promote transfer. And if so, they can keep using those techniques. But they might also notice that they're using only one kind of technique, like many of the teachers in this study who were using only hugging. If so, they might try to use other techniques like bridging so they can really saturate their course with teaching for transfer. And moving to the second bullet on this slide, uh, we also need to make sure teachers are getting feedback on their use of these techniques. Quite a few of the teachers said that they were unsure if their teaching for transfer techniques actually worked because, <clears throat> excuse me, because they had no way of knowing what students did after they left the EAP course. But there might be ways to get transfer related feedback from students while they're still in an EAP course. For example, by asking them if they are transferring learning to other courses that they are taking at the same time as the EAP course, or by asking them about ways that they plan to transfer learning to other courses in the future. This kind of information could be easy to get, and it might be satisfying for teachers who are working hard to teach for transfer. And for the final bullet, the findings of this research point in specific directions that we could take to try to make teaching for transfer a little easier for EAP teachers. For example, to deal with a curriculum that lacks specificity, and that's the first sub bullet um, here. <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me, a teacher could look for ways to make the curriculum more specific. For example, by seeing if students can be grouped together based on major. That way, the EAP course could be designed to match or hug the courses in the student's major. And that would help with low road transfer. Or if that's not possible, a teacher could try to use more bridging techniques because that could lead to more high road transfer, which could happen regardless of students' majors. The second example, which is the second sub bullet, <clears throat> is to deal with uh, students' affective issues. And here a teacher could use techniques for increasing transfer motivation, like making sure the students know that transfer can have benefits, like getting higher grades in other courses, and making sure the students actually see improvements in their EAP skills and knowledge so that they will have the confidence to transfer those skills and knowledge whenever any opportunities might come up. The third example, the third sub bullet, to deal with a curriculum that lacks flexibility, a teacher could find hugging and bridging techniques that are, that are relatively easy to insert into classes and don't take much time, like just asking students to brainstorm about where they think they might be able to transfer knowledge and skills outside the EAP course. And the fourth example, the last sub bullet, to deal with students' lack of ability, a teacher can use teaching for transfer techniques with whatever knowledge and skills the students need to learn. For example, if students need to focus on basic grammar, the teacher could have the students practice using a grammar structure in activities that resemble activities in their other courses. And that would be a kind of hugging. And the teacher could have the students look at examples of the grammar structure and then try to come up with the general rule on their own. And this would be a kind of bridging. Teaching for transfer techniques can be used with any kind of knowledge and skills, not only higher level academic knowledge and skills. So that's about it. That was the study. And from my angle, it's been really interesting looking at these teachers' perspectives on teaching for transfer. I hope you found this summary interesting. And I hope that there are some practical ideas there that you can make use of as well. So we'll end the formal part of the presentation here. And we've got plenty of time for questions and answers. And I'll just remind you, too, that uh, in case you wanted to hear an audio, this audio recording or look at the slides, uh, it'll be available on the conference website, but also on this website at the bottom of this screen. So I'll leave it there and, and open things up. Thank you.
So you've got that kind of situation that um, was part of the third general um, struggle about the curriculum possibly hindering teaching for transfer. Uh, and it was the first part of that, which is about the specificity. So it sounds like your context you're describing uh, fits this idea that, that the curriculum um, is, is over, overly specific or it's, it's, it doesn't have much generality. I'm sorry, let me <laughs> reverse that. It's overly general. It doesn't have specificity um, that would help with teaching for transfer because the students are from a, a wide range of majors or a wide range of target contexts that they're planning to go, to go out to from your course. Yeah, right. So it's, it's this idea of specificity, generality, and, and trying to find a, um, a balance there. So yeah, in a situation where the curriculum is quite general, meaning that the students are from a wide range of contexts and it's difficult for us to sort of pinpoint specific situations to prepare them for you know so one solution a couple of the solutions and we can talk about some others as well but a, a couple of the first types of solutions that come to my mind are to first of all see if it's possible and this would be more at a um at a structural level with the curriculum to see if it's possible to, you know, group students into, for example, into classes, if that was possible. And it depends on the institution, of course, if there's any flexibility for grouping students. I know that that has been done in some institutions where, you know, if you've got a multi-section course, um, if it's possible to group students into sections based on, you know, similar majors, something like that then that's a way to increase specificity. And that means that it's going to be a little bit easier for the instructor to then bring in materials from that target context. Now that would have to be done in a top down way, looking at a, you know, like a multi-section course. So it depends on the institution, whether you can do that. If, if that can't be done at the, at that level, it may be depending on the number of majors or number of target contexts. You know, if you're preparing students not only for majors, but also for future careers, future jobs. Those are, these are all target contexts that we're talking about. And if, if it's a relatively small number of target contexts in the class that you've been given, you know, maybe it's possible to group students within your own class, even if the, at the program level, you're not getting any help with that. Um, maybe it's possible to do it in your own class if there were, you know, two or three different major areas that you want to prepare students for. Put them into sort of groups and have them work together. For example, you know, maybe you've got a, a target skill that you're working on, like, um, you know, s some kind of communication skill, but the content is flexible. So you could ask this group of students to work to find some content related to their major area of study or whatever target context they're preparing for. Ask them to find content and work with that content uh, in their group. And then same thing with the other groups. So maybe you can group students within your own class. The third thing I would suggest is to think now, those things that we just talked about in terms of grouping students would help with the first teaching for transfer technique, which is hugging. And that's where we're trying to make the context of our teaching similar to target contexts. And that's gonna help with this automatic kind of transfer, what they call low road transfer. And that's great. But there's this other kind of transfer, high road transfer, which is more deliberate, more intentional. And we can still work on that regardless of any kind of grouping of our students. We can still work on high road transfer. Um, so let's say I've got an EAP class with students. Every single student is from a different major or preparing for a different career, um, I can still work on high road. So low road transfer is going to be hard for me because I can't, I can't bring in materials and try to make the activities the same as target contexts for all those students. But what I can do is whatever, whatever uh, learning outcomes I'm trying to focus on, so some sort of communication skill, um, then I can try to teach it in a way or encourage the students to really abstract that. Like, we're not just going to look at examples of this. We're going to um, try to get the students to think about general principles. So it might be, for example, maybe um, I want my EAP course to focus on the principle of um, using um, graphics to make my communication very clear, right? <clears throat> so this is something that we could use in, uh, you know, in academic presentations. You know, we're doing it today, right? Like with these slides, so we can see it in academic writing, the idea of not just using text, but where, wherever possible, if it's going to make my communication, my writing clearer, I'm going to insert tables, figures, things like that. So if that's a general principle, 
um, you know, the idea of using graphics to help make my communication clearer, that's something that I could ask the students in my class, even if they're from all these different areas, all these different target contexts, I could ask them to sort of, um, to try to come up with this idea on their own. Like I can show them examples of, of communication from a variety of different areas and say, you know, what do you notice? What's similar here? Like here's an example of an academic presentation. Here's an example of a technical report from this field. Here's an example of, of a user's guide from over here. Uh, here's an example of all these different types of documents and presentations. What do you notice? What's something similar you notice? And if they see that, you know, each of these uses graphics in some kind of a way, then they, and we can talk about that then, now they've developed a kind of a general abstract understanding of this principle about using graphics to facilitate communication. When it's abstract like that, it's gonna be a little bit more uh, available to them when they're looking at other situations outside the EAP class. So they might be able to make use of that in whatever situation they go to, they'll think like, oh, I saw this idea of using graphics in my EAP class in a bunch of different situations. Maybe I can apply it out here in this other new situation. So those are a few, few suggestions that come to mind. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that this context that I was looking at, these instructors um, are, I'm calling them, these are EAP courses, I'm using the label EAP, but these are courses that are part of bigger composition programs, first year composition programs. Uh, but all of the instructors that I worked with in this study, they were all teaching sections that were aimed at um, students with ESL related needs. So international students or domestic students with ESL related needs. So, yeah, uh, these these courses are part of bigger composition programs. In terms of, so what sort of success have we had? I, I take it as a success. This is the first time I've talked to teachers about these issues. That's not quite right. Um, I've been doing research on learning transfer. I've done a bunch of studies on learning transfer over the, over the years. Um, almost all of them, have focused on students' perspective, like looking at the work that students do. I've, I've done studies looking to see if, uh, if, the, if I look at examples of work that students do in their other courses outside a writing course, can I see examples of transfer happening? Uh, I've interviewed students to ask them if they think that they're transferring learning. So most of the studies have been like that. One early study I did, I interviewed a couple of teachers just to get their perspective. And that was the first time that I heard from any teachers that there was any kind of difficulty about teaching for transfer. But that became a secondary part of that very early study. So I didn't explore it anymore. So fast forward 15 years to where I am now, this is the first time that I'm doing a study that's focusing on the teacher's perspective exclusively. And because of that, I, I, I see it as a bit of a success. The answer to the first research question here asking, a fairly large group of instructors, you know, so, so do you teach for transfer? Because I think we can't make any assumptions about this. I mean, there's, um, I think, you know, education systems are built on an, on an expectation that learning will transfer, but it, it seems like in some situations we almost um, take for granted that if, if learning is happening, if we're teaching our classes and we can see that students are learning things in class, they're getting good scores on their tests, they're, they're doing writing assignments and we can see improvement. I think we, we may take for granted that what happens when they leave our class is that they'll transfer that learning. Um, but, that, but that's an assumption. So I think we have to be careful about that because you know research in other areas shows that it can be quite difficult for that to happen. <clears throat> so talking to this group of teachers and finding out that they are doing things to try to promote transfer, even though most of these teachers were not um, thinking specifically about the teaching for transfer techniques like hugging and bridging, they weren't thinking about it in those terms, but they were, most of them were thinking quite explicitly about like, you know, what can I do in my classes to try to promote? They weren't always using the idea or the label transfer, in fact, right? But they certainly were thinking about like, what can I do to try to teach in a way that the students will be able to make use of whatever it is that they're learning. They're learning in my class and they'll be able to apply it in other situations. They were all thinking in those terms and, and they were all taking steps 
to try to get that to happen. And I think that that's a success, right? So this group of instructors from uh, uh, how many institutions? Probably five or six institutions. Um, they all talked about at least something that they were doing to try to get this to happen. So, so I think that that's a success. Um, now, what, what I'm hoping might happen as a result of this uh, study is that maybe, um, you know, I'd certainly like to get back in touch with the folks at the di these different institutions and see if knowing what we know now, having a look at the patterns across this group of instructors, maybe there are some practical things we can do to see if we can sort of help to increase what's happening in these classes, right? You're already doing some, some potentially good stuff. So what can we do to really uh, try to saturate this, the context with more of that and maybe some, some additional things as well uh, that, that are easy to use and um, that will maximize the potential for students to transfer. So I don't know yet what the success of those things will be, but, but I'm hopeful given what I saw here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great question. I remember the very first study that I did on this topic, uh, like 15 years ago, one of the questions that came up to me was very similar to what you're asking right now. So when I was sort of thinking about the findings of that study, which focused on students, not teachers, but one of the questions that came up to me when I was looking at the results of talking to these students about transfer, um, the question of responsibility came up. I thought, you know, like whose responsibility is transfer? Because it's this interesting thing that we're expecting to happen. We're where as an EAP instructor, we want, we want our teaching to have an impact. And that means that students have, to, it's out of our hands once the students leave our class. Like ultimately the responsibility for transfer is the students, it's not us. So I think that there are different parties here, different, different folks, different groups, folks from different groups that are uh, involved of course, and have different types of impact, but ultimately the responsibility is the students. Um, now, in terms of the um, instructors, EAP instructors, and the, let's say the, the tar people in the target situation. So if it's, you know, instructors of other courses like engineering and history and, and uh, geography and so forth, those instructors, right. So there's, there's a, um, uh, a dynamic there as well, because the EAP instructors want to see this transfer happening. The, the instructors of the the other courses, that's interesting. I interviewed for another study, I interviewed a bunch of instructors. Um, that's not it. That's not the technical term, a bunch, uh, a, a large number of instructors um, of other courses. And I found that very interesting to find out how, what they thought about transfer from an academic writing course into their courses. Those, they happen to be all engineering instructors. And Mo the vast majority of them were not too concerned about transfer from an EAP course into their courses. And I mean, not concerned in the sense that they weren't, they weren't interested in what was being taught in the EAP course. They just wanted the students who were in their engineering course to perform. And it didn't matter where the students had learned those abilities and sk the skills. Uh, they just, you know, wanted the students to perform. So, so they, and in fact, um, a couple, a couple of the instructors that I spoke, who I spoke to, and classes that I observed in target situations like engineering classes, I saw things which not only suggested that the instructors were neutral or, or didn't really care about what was happening in an EAP course and whether transfer was happening to their course, they were actually negative about what about this process like um one of the and, and i'm sorry this didn't come from an instructor but one of the students that i interviewed for that study um said to me that and so this is his perception this doesn't mean the instructor actually uh, um uh, said this but the, the student felt that one of the engineering instructors had a very negative attitude towards writing courses and as a result the student felt like in that engineering course, 
he didn't want to make use of the writing skills that he'd been learning in the academic writing course, the EAP course. Now, again, that was the student's perception, but that's important, right? It, in a way, it doesn't matter what the instructor has actually said or not said. If the student thinks that there's this negative perception in, in, a, in another course, then the student who is ultimately responsible to transfer learning, it, there's going to be some issues there. Um, so yeah, so so we've got this interesting dynamic, and um, what can we do about that? So practically speaking, uh, maybe a couple of things we can say. One is that ideally, um, as EAP instructors, we would be able to to make connections. And I know this is now this is where there's going to be an issue with time. And of course, you know that's one of the issues that came up in the findings of this study, right? That EAP instructors are often bogged down with teaching. Um, you know, too many classes and too much to cover in the EAP course. So this is an ideal, I think, if uh, this first idea that, you know, if we can build connections to target situations, um, that that can help, right? So if, if uh, professor, if instructors of those other courses are um, available to, you know, share examples of assignments that they use with their students or um, you know, talk about the materials that they use, then and make those available. Maybe those are things that we can bring into our classes. That's one thing if we make those connections. Another thing is that we can have the students do this work, right? We can um, ask the students to make these connections in a way that is not, they're not just going off to their other classes and just taking their other classes, but as part of the work for the EAP course, we're asking them to report back to us about things that they see in those other classes, right? We're asking them to bring in materials from those other classes, like, okay, you know, bring in your textbook from your engineering class um, or, you know, part of it. And let's use that to, to look for things in our EAP course. Um, when you go to your next engineering class, your next history class, your next uh, geography class, um, pay attention to how questions and answers occur and report back to us in the EAP course next week, you know, things like that. So we can ask students to do that work. Um, and I think the, the, the third thing, the third and last thing I'd say about that at the moment is uh, we can also, um, if it's difficult to make these connections, these connections are going to help with hugging, right? With the first of those teaching for transfer techniques, which is about trying to create similarities between our course and the target course. So these things we just talked about, making these connections and having students bring materials back into our class, things like that, that's going to help with hugging, with making, uh, sim creating similarities. But we can also focus on bridging. And I think bridging doesn't create, <clears throat> uh, doesn't require us to make the same kinds of connections. As long as we're teaching things in a way in our own class that includes getting students to think abstractly, like to try to think about general principles, to come up with general principles then whatever situation they go out to, even if it's one that, that they haven't encountered examples of in the EAP course, they, they could be more able to transfer learning to those new situations. So even if I haven't, as an EAP teacher, even if I haven't brought materials in and made connections to that target context, um, if I've used some bridging techniques to get the students to think abstractly about what they're learning, when they encounter these new situations, um, that they they haven't seen before, or we haven't talked about in our course. Hopefully, they should be <laughs> um, more ready to transfer learning. So yeah, so there's a few ways it can happen, and I, I think that's that's an important question about responsibility. Um, whether those target th those instructors in the target situations, whether they agree that they have some responsibility for this or not, that's up in the air. I, I know some folks I've talked to um, in target situations. Uh, will be interested in trying to facilitate transfer. They might encourage students to think about things that they've learned in an EAP course and try to apply it in their course. I've seen examples of that, but I've also seen examples of, of instructors in target courses where they have no interest in what's happening in an EAP course. So I think there's a lot of variety there, um, but there are things that we can still do in an EAP course to try to get around this.